Amritas, Professor Farnadan, Professor Salmarov, Professor Laila Chuman Banu, Professor Samina Chaudhary all join. So I'm Raki Radia and Dr. Rehana Zaman, uh, who is the lead of our PHO BGN faculty, and she is from UK joined with us. Thank you, Appa. She is an on-call and very busy time in hospital. But in spite it's okay. of that, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we are ready. Okay, we are. Yes, ma'am. Respected chairperson and the learned audience, alaikum. This is Dr. Sharmin Abbasi. Welcome you all. One of the exclusive uh, session of the Planetary Health Academia. This is a session of OBGYN faculty, and we are talking today with a very important topic uh, that is uh, the vaginal birth after cesarean section because there are many talk, uh, many uh, debate regarding uh, this situation. And many of the students also know, want to know uh, about the protocol, about the uh, many things uh, regarding uh, this topic. And all of we know that the choice of the mode of the delivery in women who had delivered by cesarean section in a previous pregnancy is quite challenging because uh, the risks and benefit of elective repeat cesarean section and trial of that labor uh, that have to be weighted against each other in each woman uh, in making a choice. So the proportion of lower uterine cesarean section delivery in this group of women has reported to be high, 75 to 85% in many sitting uh, in uh, many country. And apart from the benefit, uh, the fear uh, of the liability in case of many complication and uh, during vaginal birth after cesarean section and preference request and choice of the antenatal women have largely contributed to uh, this significant higher proportion of uh, elective cesarean section after the primary cesarean section. So there is a guideline, but still in Bangladesh and other uh, South Asian region have very high trend of cesarean section rate and especially in the urban area. So what to do, what we can do, what uh, the legion can uh, tell us regarding this, uh, that we can hear from there. Uh, and today we are very much fortunate because we have the legendary professor uh, from this subcontinent who are joining with us and they will talk in deeply uh, regarding this the topic. Uh, today, as advisor of the, this session, we have the chairman of the Planetary Health Academia, Dr. Tazbirul Islam. Uh, he is the clinical associate professor of the Chicago Medical School, board certified in internal medicine, member of the Royal College of Physicians of the UK, and have many publications and many awards. And as a chairperson, we have Professor Rubina Sohel. Professor Ruvina Soel is a name of inspiration of the South Asian region of obstetrician and gynecologist. Uh, she is the consultant OBGYN at Hamid Lotif Hospital, a champion of sexual and reproductive health and rights, chair of FIGO Committee of Violence Against Women, past president of the Suffolk, and award of the Young Gynecologist Award and FRCOG addendum in 2019. And we have another chairperson who is the leader of OBGYN of Bangladesh, Professor Farhana Dawan. Professor Farhana Dawan is the pres present president of Obstetrical and Gynecology Society of Bangladesh, Deputy Secretary General of Suffolk, Professor Department of OBGYN in Ibn Sina Medical College, Deputy National Coordinator, FIGO LDI Project Bangladesh, FIGO PPH Bundle Project Bangladesh, FIGO PP IOD Project Bangladesh, Secretary General of Bangladesh Chapter of Organization of Justices, Organizing Secretary of Endometriosis at Endometriosis Society of Bangladesh, and ex-professor Department of Ops and Gyne in different medical college, especially Dhaka Medical College, Sir Solimullah Medical College, and Shohit Sarwadi Medical College. We have a, a very legendary professor among us to enlighten this session, Professor Dr. Narendra Malhotra, sir. Uh, the CV is not uh, the only limitation of uh, his judgment or of his quality. We will come later on with this big one. And as a discussion, we have Professor Raushanara Begum, Professor Salmarov, and Dr. Rehana Zaman. So first of all, I would like to talk uh, regarding uh, the PHA and what PHA is a bridging between the Asian uh, OBGYN specialist and with the overseas, the USA, UK, Canadian doctors. So may I request Dr. Tasbir Islam, the Honorable Chairperson of uh, this PHA, 
uh, to give the welcome address. Dr. Tasbeh. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sharmin, uh, for having me today and um, your very kind introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Narendra Malhotra and for giving a lecture on our platform. Actually, I was looking at his CV. Sharmin sent me yesterday, last night, and I went through, and it was going on and on. So much achievement, Dr. Narendra Malhotra. We're so proud of you. Uh, not many has that many um, uh, achievement, especially I was uh, actually I'm tomorrow and uh, next month I'm going to Dubrovnik, Croatia, and I know you're, you, you're affiliated with one of the high university there. So very nice. So, um, so um, I want to thank you for giving the lectures on our platform, and I'm pretty sure the session will be um, fabulous and very meaningful, and we will learn the pros and cons, uh, disadvantage and disadvantages, and uh, risk and benefits of VVAC. Uh, I'm being a pulmonary and critical care physician in the US. I don't deal much with the you know, VVAC, but surely uh, it will be very, very, very beneficial for the participants. Um, I want uh, to thank Professor Rohil, uh, so Rubina Sohail from Pakistan for joining us as a panelist. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are. Uh, I want to thank um, Professor Farhana Dewan. Um, I still remember um, she's from my Dhaka Medical College from I think K34, I'm K42. Uh, and she's a very close friend of uh, my, one of the favorite person, Aisha Shikdar. Uh, always Aisha Appa say very good about Farhan Appa. So, and, and another panelist, Professor Salma Rauf today, and I know she is from K37. And when we actually entered the med school, uh, they are preparing for the final prof. And I know many from their batch, like Mujib Bhai, Hafiz Bhai, all of them from that cell, uh, uh, Lira Appa. So all from uh, the, I think she has, Salma Appa is very close friend of my uh, very uh, my cousin uh, uh, Shafinas from Solomon Medical College. So, anyway, so thank you so much for having them. I can see a lot of no, uh, no new faces, uh, no known known faces like Samina, uh, Fatima Ashraf, uh, Laila, uh, so many people. So, thank you so much for having time. And last but not the least, I want to thank Rihanna. She is working relentlessly to promote this platform. She is very busy at her work, but still giving so much time um, um, to do something for uh, and for Bangladesh and the Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, I want to give a little bit brief off of the PHA. Um, as those who doesn't know about the PHA, Plant Health Academia is the largest voluntary medical education platform formed by non-resident Bangladeshi physicians in July 2020 during COVID. Um, so, so far we're doing webinar like this. We do hands-on training, uh, online certification courses. Uh, we are working on career development for medical students. Uh, we actually are offering travel fellowships and hopefully very soon, Rihanna is working to offer travel fellowships, at least two, uh, from, uh, from, to bring them to United Kingdom to get trained. Uh, so, uh, and we are doing international conferences. Last one we did in Silhet uh, on neurology. I want to invite, um, Everybody, especially uh, the, our distinguished guests today, Professor uh, Narendra Malhotra and Professor Rubina Sohel for our global summit in uh, February 2024. That will be in Dhaka for two days. It is one of a kind um, a conference. Uh, it's not like one speciality uh, conference. It will be multi-speciality conference there. You will see that three or four parallel sessions going on, cardiology, OBGY, surgery, and, and pulmonary, GI, so on. So it will be uh, one of a kind. And I really want to invite you, Professor Narendra Malhatra, Professor Rubina Mosa, Sohail, and everybody here today uh, uh, for, our, uh, uh, for our global summit. And uh, hopefully very soon, uh, we'll send out an official invitation to you all. Um, so lastly, I want to invite all the Bangladeshi, uh, those, those who are today, uh, I will talk to you. I'll be in Dhaka, inshallah, in uh, 
in uh, in November, end of November, to meet uh, the OBGY uh, uh, executives. Um, so that how can we do the session in February, uh, 2024? So thank you so much, uh, Sharmin, for having me. I want, I want to really thank you for giving me the floor and talks a little bit about the PHA and uh, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tasbirul Islam, for your nice talk, sir, and your talk always inspires us. Now, this is the time of the course scientific session. This is the time for the keynote lecture. The keynote lecture will be Professor uh, Dr. Narendra Malhotra. Sir doesn't need any introduction because he is the known face. He is the big friend for Bangladesh. And another thing I want to add here that is for the mid-level and the junior doctor, he is the mentor, he is the guy, he is the trainer, and he always inspired us to do the good works. And in the collaboration uh, with the many other societies, Sir individually, involve the mid-level and the junior doctor of Bangladesh. So hats off to you, sir. And we are very much grateful to you and respect and gratitude from the Bangladeshi OBGYN and OBGYN Society to you. Sir doesn't need any introduction. Uh, she, uh, he is the Managing Director of Global Rainbow Healthcare, Director AAT Rainbow IVF, Director of the Foxy Sriti CSE, Director International Relationship of the CEPHO, National Director of the Ian Donald School of Ultrasound, past vice president of the Suffolk and founder editor of the Suffolk Journal, member of FIGO Guideline Committee, and also uh, there is advisor to the IVF unit of the many countries. And one thing I want to uh, give importance in here to the mid-level and the junior doctor regarding the paper, the chapter published and regarding the publication of the cert. If you uh, see here, over 125 paper, 300 chapter published, over 500 presented paper, over 1000 guest lecture given in India and abroad, 58 oration, 37 published paper, over 356 keynote lecture. So what a CV this is. And it is a very much inspiring curriculum vity of the young and the junior doctors. So welcome, Professor Narendra Malhotra. All of the Bangladeshi OBGYN are waiting for your extensive lecture on VBAC in South Asia perspective. There are 121 already joining the Zoom and 2000 in the social media is joined with us. So your lecture will be a guideline and your lecture will be a very inspiring for us to optimization of the CS, to reduce the CS rate while all over the South Asian region. Now over to Dr. Narendra Malhotra, sir, sir, please. Very good evening to all of you. It's indeed, Slava Alaikum. It's indeed a pleasure to be on this platform today. Uh, I never thought, that this I thought it was a Bangladesh meeting. It's it's actually an international platform, and uh, I've been given a very difficult uh, topic because uh, to discuss trial of labor after cesarean and we back tolac and we back is is uh, not very easy, especially in our because of various reasons which we'll try to find out and discuss. Mainly being the obstetrician distress. That is the main, main reason. Now, when we say Caesar, a lot of people say Julius Caesar was born that way. No, he was not born that way. It was a Roman law under him, which allowed women who uh, died during pregnancy, their abdomen to be cut open and the child be brought out. So the first Caesarean actually in Greek mythology was an Apollo removed axillus from his mother's dead mother's abdomen. Since then, today is once a Caesarean, always a Caesarean. So it's been a hegemony of dictums. In 1916, Craigman said, once a cesarean, always a cesarean. Then in 1966, Postman said that once a cesarean, always a trial of labor. And since 1997, it is once a cesarean, always a controversy. So let's define these words which we are going to use or what we are going to say today. So we have TOLAC. TOLAC is trial of labor after cesarean. Uh, it is a planned attempt to deliver vaginally by a woman who has had a previous cesarean section, regardless of the outcome. While VBAC is a successful vaginal birth after the trial of labor. So it's actually going to be TOLAC first. And if you succeed, it will be called as the VBAC. Now, what do we do when uh, when we have uh, elective uh, when we have a cesarean section? 
we can do a elective repeat cesarean delivery which is ercd or ercs or we can offer tolac and this tolac will have two two outcomes you can have a successful tolac which is vbac or you can have a failed tolac which will lead into ecd ecd is emergency cesarean section so these are the options for a patient who has had a previous cesarean section now when we look at the cesarean section rate the vbac rates are inversely proportional more the cesarean lesser the vbac that is and more so after see total uh, primary and all and this has been the trend and uh, it has it has been the trend till 2007 when this data was available and then now today it is the trend is following so you see the total cesarean and the vbac falling uh, after the cesarean section and then uh, in various years various organizations made out their statement acog supported vbac and said rupture is rarely catastrophic 1996 macmahon said it is very adverse 1999 acog said immediately a c section should be available nibh vbac conference was held and acog in 2011 said gave some different guidelines so in 1984, the ACOG encouraged TOLAC, trial of labor. In 1988, the same AOCG said the concept of repeat cesarean section should be replaced by a specific indication for abdominal delivery. So they said you can still give, if there is a specific indication, do an abdominal delivery rather than give a TOLAC. In 1996, the, uh, the New England Journal published study said VBAC is very risky and it is riskier than what was initially summarized. So let's look at the morbidity and mortality with it. The total complications with trial of labor for 7.9 percent, major complication, 1 to 2 percent, minor complications were always there. And if there was an elective cesarean section, the trial of labor and the complications are almost the same. So if you do an elective second caesar or give a trial, the complication probably are the same. What ACOG said, if you're going to give a trial of labor, the obstetrician should be immediately available on site. And it should not be by the midwives. It should be under the guidance of an obstetrician or a trained physician who is available to immediately do an emergency cesarean section. So the NIH VBAC conference in 2010 said that there is an increase in perinatal mortality from to total uh, trial of labor in small and the rates are comparable to the laboring nulliparis. So if a primary and a tolac is almost same, but there is increased rates of placenta previa and placenta accreta syndrome in the previous cesarean section group. So there should be a readily available anesthetist and a readily available obstetrician to take care of. Now, which women should go or are best suited for the trial of labor after caesar? or a vaginal birth uh, after season success. So planned VBAC or TOLAC is appropriate for and may be offered to a majority of women with singleton pregnancy of cephalic presentation at 37 weeks or a little bit beyond who have had a single previous lower segment cesarean section with or without a history of a vaginal birth. So first normal birth, second caesar, you can give them a trial. First cesarean, second time she's come, you can give them a trial. And this was the RCOG guidelines of 2015. But today in our situation, there are lots of concerns. And these are rarely followed. For us, it is still, most of us, it is still once a caesar, always a caesar. Why? What are the concerns? Concerns are mainly about us. So it's more of an obstetrician uh, distress and the legal implications against the obstetrician if complications arise. Then there are concerns about the society, how well equipped we are, our primary health centers, our rural health centers, and the patient herself. And then, of course, the statistics and numbers which guide us saying that the trial of labor cases are much less than the repeat cesarean section, elective repeat cesarean section. So we are under a lot of attack from everywhere. And this is common, not only in India, in the, all the Southeast Asia. And it's only the, even the senior doctors, the three or four of them who helped me 
make this uh, presentation, Shaila Jamal and the others, are many of us, are we really confident on offering and conducting a VBAC or a TOLAC? Because if you have a VBAC or a TOLAC in labor, your whole day is going to be sitting with that patient. And you're not going to do, probably not going to do anything else. And that is how concentration is required and monitoring is required. So let's see what are the uh, versus elective Caesar and VBAC. Now you have the stats say, if you give a proper trial, you have a 72% chance that the TOLAC will be successful and it, you'll get a vaginal birth. There is 0.5, it is 1% now or 0.9 rather of the scar rupturing. So 0.9% increased likelihood of the third delivery being a vaginal if you are an instrumental. The maternal death risk is about 4 per 100,000. The infant risk is transient respiratory morbidity, hypoxic uh, ischemia and encephalopathy and 0.04% risk of delivery rated prenatal death. While with elective seizure, it's an operation and it, but it avoids the uterine rupture. You have a longer recovery. The future pregnancies all will be there's slightly higher mortality if it's done in rural settings and the risk of transient uh, respiratory distress, etc. So 2018, ACOC said that all women with previous cesarean should be offered a TOLAC. RCOG 2015 said you should have a checklist for elective seizure and a TOLAC and then make a decision on the checklist and whether you're going to be successful or not. So how do we select? Now we select candidates who are one previous lower segment tra uh, transfer cesarean delivery. We select a person who has an adequate pelvis, no other uterine scar, no previous rupture. So no, no myomectomy scars or, or a septum resection or things like that. The physician available throughout active labor, you have to be sitting there, capable of monitoring labor and performing an emergency cesarean section. Availability of an anesthetist and personal for emergency cesarean section. So these are the main guidelines you have. So what are the contraindications? Contraindications is not a transverse scar on the abdomen, but a vertical scar on the uterus. So previous high vertical uh, classical scar, a T-shaped incision, three or more pre previous seizure, or maybe two now we say, obstetric and medical complications, malpresentations, APH, PIH, eclampsia, medical disorders, heart disease, renal disease, uh, asthma, seizures, inability to perform an emergency cesarean due to uh, insufficient staff. So you plan the delivery and where the most of the time women refuse herself. So these would be the contraindication and lead to. So let's see why in my country what is happening and what we are doing. Now in our country, India, 47.4% per person babies are born in private sector. This has reduced uh, just about uh, five to 10 years back, it was 70%. Now the government facilities have improved and we have a very, very good maternal child health centers attached to all the medical colleges, 350 medical colleges and some 200 district hospitals. So 47% are still happening in the private domain. And as per the National Health Survey, who's talking? The trend of cesarean section in India is on the rise. And uh, 2005, probably it was 8.5%, which I'm not sure is correctly reported. And today it says it's 21.5%. I'm sure this is also not correctly reported. It's over 35% according to what uh, survey which I did. And some teaching hospitals have and tertiary care centers are having as high as 70% cesarean section. They are not at fault. It is the problem cases which are coming there and the normal deliveries are happening at the lower centers. And I feel, I think the trend is similar in uh, Southeast Asia. These are, now we have a lot of papers from India which have uh, done TOLAC and VBAC and which have discussed this and I'll be quoting a few of them and these studies are all available on the internet and you Google them on PubMed. We, we have papers from India in our journals published about VBAC. The result according to most of these papers were good. 
and uh, this is a 9.8 percent previous one cesarean section out of 67 percent underwent tolac and VBAC happened in 71 percent so we need not get scared this this is this was the result of all these studies which are there and so successful vaginal delivery did occur in the other study to the tune of 57 to 60 percent so we can but all this data has come from tertiary care centers so you need to have a tertiary care center where you could get a favorable result from a trial of labor after cesarean section and land up into a successful b bag when we compare public institutions with the private institutions the trial of labor and VBAC in emergencies is very less elective planned. See, if a previous season lands up in early labor at midnight in a medical college or a district hospital, which is equipped, the resident there is going to do a cesarean section. And the patients, because there are about 10, 15 deliveries happening every day, every in, the, in that whole night, and there are 10, 15 cesarean happenings, so almost some institutions are delivering 30, 40 babies a day. And that, that may be one of the reasons why uh, a lot of these institutions do not try for labor after cesarean and they go straight away in elective plants. So less than 25% of patients who've had previous section attempt a trial of labor because of various reasons, which I've just discussed. So what are the barriers? The barriers are because of the knowledge, because of the awareness, because there are so many factors which influence the success of VBAC and prior uterine incision, prior uterine rupture, how the incision was closed, inter-delivery interval, number of prior seizures, uh, incision, prior vaginal delivery, indication for the prior cesarean section, fetal size, multiple gestation, maternal obesity. All these have to be taken in mind. So the risk of rupture, if you see, if it's classic, 9%, T-shape, 9%, low vertical, 1% to 7%, low transverse, 0.2% to 1.5%, and prior, prior rupture, if the lower segment has ruptured, 6% it'll rupture in the next, and upper rupture, 32%. So these are the risk estimations you've got to make. And the closure of the prior incision, if you know. So there is uh, no relationship between those who were closing it one layer or two layers. And uh, in 2003 also said no increased risk of rupture or deacence in single layer. But again, the recent studies have said that we should start closing in two layers because of the uh, risk of formation of histamoceles and all. What about inter-delivery interval? Having at least 24 months, that is two years between the date of last cesarean section and the due date of this pregnancy increases the chances of a VBAC. If the interval is less than 18 months, there you're going to be less successful and probably better off planning an elective rather than giving them risk. People have attempted TOLAC in previous two cesarean sections also, but I don't think that should be very, very advisable, even though the rupture rates are 2 to 5% only, but they're quite big because they're catastrophic. What about prior vaginal delivery? If a person with a cesarean had a vaginal delivery, then that is the single best predictor for a successful VBAC. Now, if you've had a VBAC, the next will be 87 to 90% VBAC. So you will be successful. And the rate of rupture will increase, but after every... So if you go to have three or four, then it might be weakening that scar. So indications of previous... If it is a non-recurrent indication, that means breach, oblique, transverse lie, fetal distress, dystocia, failed induction. You might uh, try a TOLAC this time and induction and see how the progress occurs. Fetal size, of course, uh, if the fetus is more than 3.5, 4 kgs, it is going to be a cesarean rather than a TOLAC. Twin or multiple pregnancies, well, if it is not too big, there is no extra risk, but still they say that Vaginal deliveries are going to be less after seizure if you have a uh, multiple gestation. Maternal obesity will definitely decrease the risk success of VBAC. And 85% uh, uh, with normal BMI, 78% with BMI between 25 and 30, and 70% in between 30 and 40, and only 60% with 
with a BMI of 40. So BMI high, lesser chances. So what should we be doing? How should we? We should give them a very, very good antenatal care. And this is the antenatal care testing protocols, which our association, Federation of OBGYN made. Uh, what are the recommended tests and what are the preferable tests? And all pregnancies should be offered a complete maternal fetal screening. We also need to do a lot of counseling by a senior consultant, which is so many times not possible. On an average in India, a pregnant patient is seen by a senior consultant only for two and a half to three minutes. Now, what all will you explain to them? You have to tell them diet, exercise, good weight gain, everything you have to tell them about pregnancy. So we developed an app, which is known as iMums. Even you can uh, give it to your patients. It is free of cost. And this app guides them through music, yoga, talk to the baby exercises, community support, and all about pregnancy and all about how to prepare for normal labor and how to prepare and how to get ready for delivery. So this is one of the very good ways where digital uh, platforms can be of help in counseling. What you should be doing at the booking, uh, the number of uterine scars, the indication, perpural complications. These are special points which have to be highlighted by red on the antenatal card. Gestation are at the time of previous cesarean section, interconception interval, associated medical problems, anticipated family size. She wants only two, she wants three, she wants four, and a history of successful vaginal delivery. So these points have to be highlighted on your antenatal card. And of course, antenatal counseling, I said, if it is difficult for you, let the digital app do the, uh, and this app won the best, second best app developed in India in COVID times. And it, it was seen also on Shark Tank and all the news and uh, items. And because 12 million women are logged on to this app currently all over the world. What about intrapartum after antenatal properly monitoring them? Intrapartum con continuous monitoring, uh, arrangement of blood, facilities for continuous monitoring, specialists available on site, obstetrician, anesthetist, and pediatrician. Round the clock with this laboring woman till she delivers. That is what is required. Continuous layer monitoring, electronic monitoring is recommended following the onset of uterine contraction. So you can pick up, see sometimes silent ruptures happen and the only sign could be a deteriorating uh, uh, cardiotopography trace. So that is very, very important to, uh, to find uterine rupture. Intrapartum ultrasound also we are doing and we can here, you can see here and we're looking at the scar thickness. If the scar thickness or dehiscence can be picked up by intra, uh, intra. Of course, a very good partogram. This is a simple partogram which we follow now of the two lines and it should be going parallel to this line, preferably delivering here or maybe here and not definitely crossing the action line. Plus all other parameters on the same page, the oxytocin, the drugs, the pulse, the BP, the hydration, the fetal heart rate, the amniotic fluid, and the molding every two to three hourly monitoring the progress of labor. What about analgesia? Yes, epidural analgesia can be used and uh, with to, for pain relief and may encourage women to go in for a trial of labor after seizure if you give them a proper good analgesia. So effective regional anesthesia should not mask the sign of the uterine rupture. Should be careful there. How do we deliver? We let the labor progress till full dilatation and then remember you have to cut short the second stage of labor. So do not allow a long second stage of labor, whether you're going to use a Ventus or whether you're going to use an outlet Wrigley's forceps to just cut short. That depends on your expertise and the expertise of the consultants. So here again, experienced consultant is required for handling the second stage of labor. Should we augment the labor in uh, VBAC? Yes, with proper, you can, with proper pumps. So no extra oxytocin goes in. And uh, the prostaglandin uh, will be given after the delivery. So that, uh, that for after elective cesarean delivery. Uterine rupture is the most dreaded complication. And here we saw one case which ruptured during labor. And we picked it up by ultrasound there. And the uterine rupture could be silent 
would be painless. Ekdam the pains vanish. Fresh gush of blood. Abnormal CTG. Heart sound is vanish. And you have a huge maternal morbidity and mortality also. So very early diagnosis of uterine scar rupture and quick laparotomy uh, is very, very uh, essential. Of course, blood has to be there. Now, uterine rupture versus uterine dehiscence. Uterine rupture is complete disruption of all the layers of the uterus associated with one or more of the following. Hemorrhage, hysterectomy required, injury to bladder, extrusion of fetal uh, placental unit, cesarean uh, delivery for suspected rupture and fetal distress. The scar is ruptured. Dehiscence is asymptomatic uterine disruption, which may be complete or incomplete and sometimes has no effect on the mother if it is picked up. So the, the uterus thin layer is still holding on. So if you intervene correctly, you are going to save the baby and the mother. Now you will get an abnormal CTG, the de de decelerations, the bradycardia severe. You will get acute onset of scar tenderness, hematuria, and uh, cessation of uh, contractions, maternal tachycardia, hypotension, fainting, shock, loss of station of presentation, all these inexperienced uh, gynecologists. Change of the abdominal contour will be there and uh, you'll not be able to pick up the fetal heart. So these are what we uh, consultants dread. We are scared of dehiscence. We are very scared of rupture. We need an ICU backup uh, or an obstetric HDU backup. We need blood transfusions and uh, we need a neonatal NICU to tackle the neonatal hypoxia and face sometimes face stillbirths. So the ideal TOLAC patient would be non-obese, singleton, average size baby, term, that means 37, spontaneous onset of labor, you've not induced it and has had a previous child. These are the ones which I am going to try for labor if the patient agrees. So what if you're not having such an ideal candidate? Now, if you're not having an ideal candidate, you need to plan the cesarean or you might to have to land up in what I said, ERCS or emergency cesarean section uh, at if the failed labor. So what are the benefits and risks? TOLAC, the risk to the fetus, risk to the mother and landing up into emergency. Su successful VBAC has the fewest complications. Unsuccessful VBAC will lead to emergency cesarean have more complications. So it, is it the fear of litigation to the obstetrician that is causing less uh, of these? Yes, maybe yes, because we are scared of in cases involving fetal distress, uterine rupture, shoulder dystocias, misdiagnosis, uh, and all that. And 7.2% of total medical litigations it's happening in India has become obstetric in the last four years or so. So preparation is the key. You have a VBAC calculator. This is the score. And the vaginal birth after cesarean calculator, age, pre-pregnancy weight, height, RS disorder, obstetric history. And you give them a score of 2 and 0 according to age. Vaginal birth, you give them 4 to 1. Reasons for first seizure, you give them 0 or 1. Cervical effacement on admission, 1 or 0. Cervical dilatation, 1 or 0. If the score is less than 3, VBAC is not recommended. If the score is more than four, then you can go ahead and try and you might be successful. So utility of these scores was four and less than four and more than six, it is very good, almost 100%. A cut of five would give you a sensitivity of about 72% landing. So this was Flam's original study where he said, if you follow the VBAC score, VBAC calculator score, then you are likely to get 69% uh, in the trial of labor in 69 patients, 65%. And once again, to uh, summarize obstetric history, review, general obstetric examination, pelvic assessment, put them in the score. Your facility should be prepared. So skilled obstetrician, neonatologist, very skilled nursing staff, availability of anesthetists equipped with OT, CTG, ready availability of all operation facilities within 30 minutes. Patient counseling is very, very important during the antenatal period. Motivating staff is required and involvement of the counseling of the partner and the family members are also required. By 36, 37 weeks, they should be counseled that you're going to 
have a vaginal delivery of milk. A very informed consent form. And there is a special consent for trial of labor after cesarean or a TOLAC consent. And this detailed consent form should be filled by the patient. So avoid litigations. And then the knowing of the complications and outcomes to the mother and to the fetus has to be discussed. So we need to have all these in the chart. And uh, if you have all these and a favorable score of more than six, go ahead and try and you're likely to succeed. If you're not and you are a nervous substitution and the patient has come midnight and you want do not want to disturb your sleep, which is happening to us, to all of us these days, then you'll of course land up into a elective planned cesarean uh, or a emergency cesarean. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, there is consensus by the NICE, the Royal College, the American College, National Institute that planned VBAC is clinically safe. And this choice should be given to the women who have had a 24 months uh, uh, gap between this pregnancy and the last, the due date of this. And such a strategy will limit at least the escalation of the rising cesarean section. And maybe it will help in the complications of cesarean section uh, will reduce. We have uh, taken the references from all RCOG and all, all that. And of course, to be on the lighter side, today in India, you can see a priest or a pandit inside the labor room, an OT, and every day we get two or three requests. I want my baby out at 10 a.m. 12 minutes and 20 seconds. So there I am standing there waiting for that 10 a.m. 12 minutes to happen. And God forbid, if I run into additions, I will not be able to deliver it. And then, uh, of course, this uh, internet, Google, Dr. Google, and the mobile phones are saying, I was booked, but I have another meeting, so I have to go. I have a, I, only today I have a judge who has a, a very, very important interview for promotion. And she has to travel 300 kilometers from Agra and come back. And this interview is on 21st of August. That is day after. And she, her delivery date is 24th. So what do I do? Either she goes and delivers there because she might land up into labor or she should have delivered 10 days. I would have done an elective season 15 days before and then let her go at day 20 or just pray that she'll come back in time. So thank you very much. A prepared mind is worth a thousand ounces. So you need to have your mind prepared and your facilities prepared if you want to prepare for TOLAC and be back. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharmin and all for inviting me to give this prestigious uh, talk on this prestigious platform. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Narendra Malhotra, sir, for your fantastic and wonderful presentation, sir. It's a big hand to you from all of our OBGYN specialists, sir. And you cover A to Z of the VBAC. And there are lots of questions from the general audience to you. So if we get the time, we can give the answer of this Questions question. Rubina will answer. <laughs> yes, all of them. <laughs> Those who do toilet okay. will answer. <laughs> Uh, but you said in the last slide, it is very challenging, sir, uh, to reduce the cesarean section rate on maternal requests because time specific, date specification, and they want the elective cesarean section, and especially the high risk group and the long infertility and after that, uh, the pregnancy, all of them want the cesarean section for the delivery. So may I request Professor Farnada and Madam, the Honorable Chairperson of this session, and Madam is the leader of the OBGYN Society of Bangladesh. So from your point of view, Madam, uh, give your thoughts regarding the presentation of the Professor Narendra Malhotra, sir, and uh, what you were thinking, because we are passing through a very challenging path regarding the reduction, uh, the rate of the cesarean section in our country also. So what's your thought, what's your plan, and in, in your tenor, what you want to do, Madam, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. And I had a very fantastic experience with Dr. Narendra's presentation. It was really an eye-opening for me because I, I learned some new things from his presentation. I just like to highlight a bit from his presentation. That is, he during the TOLAC, he mentioned that the obstetrician should be available all the time, the anesthesiologist should be there, and we should decide, decide when we go for the planned C-section. 
And then he also mentioned that uh, senior doctor must be there. I think these are the challenges which we have when we are planning for our CS. Then he went on discussing about the app. I think it is something new for us as well. That is the app of the antenatal care, the mom's app. Uh, and I think if they have it in India, I think we can think of adapting it. And the intrapartum monitoring, he mentioned that the continuous electronic monitoring is very important. And during the antenatal care, the uh, counseling is very, very important regarding explaining to the woman what she is going to undergo. Then he explained about the interpart during the interpartum. He immediately explained about the regional anesthesia. I think it's very important. But one thing he said that whether it, it doesn't mask the uh, rupture where there is a silent rupture. And of course, we know about cutting short the second stage of labor. And uh, about the uh, ideal tolak patient, there should be. Um, there he specifically mentioned what will be the criteria. I think we should all go for it. And another thing new for me was the scoring system. And he has mentioned that if the score is more than six, we can go for. I think this is one thing we can adapt. Very important for us. And uh, lastly, he said that um, the twenty-four months cap. I think these are the. Uh, he has he has done a very nice presentation, but these are the important things from his presentation, which I think. Because and now I would like to say a few words from myself, from my side, and that is that uh, regarding uh, uh, yeah, I have a few, one or two slides to show us as well. Uh, but uh, in our in Bangladesh, we are uh, doing the VBAC in some of the centers, and this is one consent from because uh, all of us are following the. Green Top Guideline 2015, which Dr. Narendra showed at the center. At the end, we are all following the uh, VBAC guide, the um, Green Top Guideline, that is RCOG guideline. So here we'll see the feasibility of it in the in different hospitals. One of our center, they have made a consent for, for form for the woman. So this is the uh, this is what we will say. There are ten points here. The first point is. Having one previous CN section, you are now eligible to deliver vaginally. And she will be informed that among four women, three may have a vaginal delivery, 72 to 60, 76% chance. And if she has one previous vaginal delivery, the chance is more. That is what Dr. Narendra also showed us in his slide. Next one. Sharmin, next slide. Yeah. The doctor will also inform them the doctor will check you during the antenatal period. That is the uh, during the antenatal period, we'll decide whether she'll have the vaginal delivery or she's eligible or not. And uh, this is one thing which differs from my uh, protocol in OGSB. We have a protocol where we, we usually wait for seven days because we all know that a patient may not deliver, uh, not go, may not go into spontaneous labor seven days back. But here, seven days early, but they have mentioned anyway, it is a, one of the center where they said that if the woman comes in labor one day, one week earlier, that is easy. And if she delivers vaginally, their risk will be less for the future. And we are go on to describe that previous two CS is not a good case. And if she gave for vagina Devi, she should be admitted in an equipped hospital. That is also told from, we learned from Dr. Nonizu's presentation. And uh, she, uh, next, this is the last two points. The, if you, during vaginal delivery, uh, we should do the every step is taken the, rightly, then there is no risk. And la, lastly, she will be told about the caution. I think this is very important. And uh, this, uh, in different hospitals, we have the statistics where the VBAC rate is uh, ranges from uh, two, three to nine percent. Next, that is another hospital. In uh, now next, not this one, yeah. So this is Ch Chiragong Chattogram Medical. This is outside Dhaka, where the VBA VBAC rate is also a range. There is a range. So I think that this is important for us to know that there are some challenges which I would like to mention in the end. This is another hospital, uh, Ashulia Women and Child, is known as the IWCH. There, there is also the VBAC is like. It is more than 10%, the VBSC rate. So this is one of the flowchart which the doctors follow when they do the uh, planned VBSC. And the, in one of their studies, there was success was 66%. In OGSB protocol, we have a protocol from OGSB where we have all we, we already decide 
uh, how we will go about for the vaginal delivery, what is the risk, when it will be end in a, like Dr. Narendra has mentioned that TOLA, when it is successful, that will be basic. So if it is VBAC, this is our protocol from OGSP. So uh, on the left side is when we go for the vaginal, elective vaginal delivery. And the right side flowchart shows that will, when we will allow the spontaneous vaginal delivery, what are the criteria, and when will it be successful? And if it is not successful, if it is normal progress, it will end up in vaginal delivery, not abnormal process. Abnormal progress, it may go to uh, cesarean section. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sharmin. I just have a few words regarding the challenges in Bangladesh. We need a definite protocol. We need a specific checklist for all, and we should disseminate the protocol to all the centers. Everybody will have, be in the same page with the same protocol and uh, audit, very clear audit system should be in our country. And this will be disseminated to all centers and uh, the, identify the primary season. I think the most important thing is we can see that the primary season rate should also be reduced simultaneously in these cases. Uh, I would like to thank you, Sharmin, and thank the audience for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pranadhan, Madam, for your nice word, and you are working very hard. And uh, I want to mention it uh, with proud that in Bangladesh, to reduce the cesarean section, that you are proudly at with the Robson classification system also in all over the Bangladesh, and especially in the uh, country, rural area and, and urban area both. So thank you very much, Madam, for joining with us. May I now request uh, Dr. Rubina Sohel, Madam? Professor Rubina Sohel is a good friend for Bangladesh, a very known face to the vision specialist of Bangladesh. And uh, she is one of the leader of the Suffolk South Asian region uh, obstetrician and gynecologist also. Sometimes in the, some mid-level and the junior doctor, I want them, uh, what do you want in your life? Some say that I want to be a obstetrician and gynecologist like Rubina Sohel. So it is very oh. much a privilege for us uh, to get you in today's webinar, madam. So may I request, uh, you are one of the chairperson of this session, uh, regarding we are passing very challenging situation of reduction of the cesarean section rate in South Asian region, especially Bangladesh, India, and other countries. So what is your take home message? How can uh, make it more easy, more friendly, the VVAC system in all over the South Asian region countries? Over to you, madam. Thank you very much, Shermin, for this excellent introduction and uh, Narendra for a very, very well presented talk on a difficult subject. And Dr. Tisbul Islam, thank you very much for the introduction that you gave to us to bring us all together on this forum. I think that the topic that we are talking about is an extremely difficult topic. And I would like to take you back to when we talked about, so I'm going to do it in two parts. One, I'm going to show you a small presentation where I want to link reducing the primary cesarean section rate because I really think that this is what, can I have a full screen please? Because I really think that this is a very, very important area where we need to be thinking about that. How are we going to reduce our cesarean section rate? Next slide please. So if you look at it, I just wanted to share this study with you. And uh, this is the study basically from the Saffold region. And uh, this was uh, spearheaded by Dr. Lubna Hassan. And it took data from the South Asian countries. And this was examining the efficacy of Robson classification system for optimizing the cesarean section rates in South Asia. And I would not like to go into further detail, but just to say that there were 37,000 women who were enrolled in the a study belonging to five different hospitals in different countries. And the rate of cesarean section, that composite rate that came up was 36%. And the women who had cesarean section belonged to groups one, two, and five. And if you go, can go on to the next slide, I will show you what are the groups one, two, and five. So we need to understand what are the groups. So group one is the group of nulliparous women who have got an uncomplicated pregnancy, but we know that people who are women who are coming to us with false pains in poor bishop scores, sometimes when they come to the hospital, they are induced unnecessarily. Group two women are the women who are again induced and group three are the women who are multi-parous women, sometimes because of the wrong estimation of the dates, they are induced. Can you go to the next slide, please? So, the Robson classification system, which is the 10 group classification, basically takes five factors into account. The obstetrical history, in which parity in the previous cesarean section, onset of labor, fetal lie, the number of neonates, and the gestational age. Next, please. 
Now, again, if you look, look at it, the reasons for cesarean section in most of the cases in the study were 30 full-term pregnancies, single-term, uncomplicated pregnancies, but presenting to us in labor and cesarean section was done for various reasons. And fetal distress actually came out to be a big reason in the study. Then those women who were unnecessarily induced. And the third group was the women in which Narendra was talking about, that women who had previous cesarean sections and now they presented to us. Next, please. Now, the question is that what can we do to reduce all these instances? Next, please. So if you look at these causes and you, if you look at the conditions, that why did this again happen? So when a woman in her first pregnancy comes with false pains even to the labor room, many a times a cesarean section is done for non-reassuring CTT. Many a times they are induced unnecessarily because they were gestational diabetic or they were pregnancy-induced hypertension, and then cesarean section is done for failure of induction. And then fear of VBAC, as Narendra very aptly said, in, in the mind of the doctor, more than in the mind of the patient, many a times results in unnecessary cesarean section. So what are our solutions and what can we do? Next, please. So basically, next please. So basically what we have to do is to take out these three most common causes of cesarean sections. The first thing is that we have to ensure that we provide good antenatal care. We ensure that the complications are kept to a minimum. The nutrition and weight management is emphasized upon. We make sure that we manage non-communicable disease in a fashion that the diseases are well controlled, not affecting the growth of the baby. Thus, avoiding unnecessary induction of labor. So FIGO guidelines do not advise induction of labor in well-controlled diabetes. But if you look at the South Asian region, most of the people are going to induce labor in gestational diabetes at 37 or 38 weeks. Pregnancy-induced hypertension, if the baby is of good size, there is no protein urea, then there is no indication for induction of labor. But most of the people will induce labor even in this. Then induction of labor by choice without adequate counseling, we will induce labor. If we have to attend a conference, we will feel comfortable about inducing labor. So induction of labor needs to be looked at very critically. And in services hospitals where I work for a very long time, we actually started reducing our induction of labor. And when we started reducing induction of labor and the decision of induction of labor was taken by senior consultants rather than the trainees, the cesarean section rate dropped. When we decided that in free labor, we are not going to do anything rather than we will send the patient home, the cesarean section rate dropped. When we decided that we are going to implement the WHO labor care guide, and not do anything before five centimeter of labor, this is again section rate drop. So actually there are a lot of things which we can do to reduce the primary cesarean section rate, which also means avoiding induction of labor in primary gravida and multipara, avoiding induction of labor in and auditing the cesarean sections very, very carefully to avoid unnecessary inductions. Implementation of labor care guide is a good tool to reduce the rain section rate. So what can we do? We have to use this Robson classification very, very consistently. And I'm so glad that Dr. Farhana Dewan is implementing the Robson classification system in all the facilities because that will identify the primary causes of high C-section rate. And then we are going to put in the interventions which are going to reduce the cesarean section. I think I will stop over here and come back to how are we going to improve the vaginal delivery rate if we have got patients who have got cesarean sections. I've talked about them. So, uh, Sharmin, you can uh, basically stop the, I can, uh, if I can go back to the slide, please. Sorry. Can I go back to the slide? Thank you. Just wanted to say a little bit about this as well. Primary gravida cesarean section rates needs to be lowered. The allowable rate is 10 to 15% by WHO. We need to make sure that we have a strong indication when we are making a decision for cesarean section. Competent and senior gynecologists should make a decision and junior doctors, especially in teaching hospitals, should avoid that decision. Induction of labor rate should be reduced. Fetal distress should be handled more effectively. Uh, so at the first indication of uh, a deceleration, a cesarean section should not be performed. Rather, a clear cut evaluation system should be available. Regular audit for cesarean sections and then encourage VBAC. Thank you very much for this. You can stop screen sharing now. 
Now, the second thing is that when we are planning a patient and selecting a patient for VBAC or for going through the trial of labor, it is very important that we do a detailed counseling. We take informed consent. Uh, in Pakistan, and especially in our setup, we make sure that we uh, sweep the membrane starting from 37 weeks onwards. Sometimes that can help in softening of the cervix and women go into labor rather easily uh, if we don't touch them and don't do anything to them. So we make it a point that we sweep the membranes every week starting from 37 weeks onwards. Again, having said that, when the patient comes with mild pains, we need to have a patient attitude and we need to wait. Only when the woman is in established labor, then we need to augment. And then with one-to-one -one monitoring, if we are augmenting labor, we have to make sure that the contractions remain three in 10 minutes. So if you're having more frequent contractions, then it means that the chances of rupture of the uterus are going to increase because the contractions will be too frequent. So very judicious use of oxytocin, one-to-one -one monitoring and ensuring that the contractions do not come before three minutes. So very frequent contractions can increase the risk for the woman. And then maintaining a partogram is also of a lot of help because that will tell you whether you're going in the right direction or not. I think having said that, as Narendra also said and Farhana also mentioned, that the facility has to be ready to identify complications quickly and to, in and to intervene and act for a quick cesarean section if in case you decide for a cesarean section or you think that there is a probability of rupture of the uterus. Early intervention is important to save not only the life of the mother, but more importantly, to save the life of the baby. I think I'll stop over here because I see that there are quite a few questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Thank you for your nice addition and your uh, again, inviting uh, into the global summit. If you join with us, it will be a very fruitful OBGYN session for us. And also the Narendra Sar also uh, is invited in our session. So this is the time for the discussion. And after the short discussion, we go to the question and answer session. For the discussion session, we have Professor Salmarov. Professor Salmarov is the present Secretary General of Obstetrical and Gynecological Society of Bangladesh, Professor of OBGYN. And uh, he she worked in many uh, government medical college of our country, especially Dhaka Medical College for a long time, Vice President of Fetal Maternal Medicine Society of Bangladesh, Scientific Secretary of Pediatric Adolescent and Gynecology Society, Organizing Secretary Endometriosis Adenomyosis Society of Bangladesh, Chairman of the Question Bank Development Disappears, and Member of the Medical Education Department. And also we have Dr. Rehana Zaman. Dr. Rehana Zaman is the Faculty Lead of PH, Consultant Obstetrician and Gynecologist at Nobles Hospital Isle of Man, UK and member of various society, including the British Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, member of the Advisory Committee of Bangladesh Liaju Group of RCOG, and chairperson of Bangladesh Liaju Group of RCOG. So first of all, I want to know from Dr. Rehana Zaman, Appa, what is your experience regarding UK? And UK, what you are doing to uh, reduce the cesarean section? And many of uh, our doctor want to know from you uh, regarding the prediction of the success of the VBAC. So would you shortly add here? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Ma Professor Nayadra Malhotra for a very uh, nice presentation, and it was very thorough. Uh, he started from the history, and he actually went through the uh, all the things we wanted to know, uh, including the VBAC calculator as well, or as a predictor. So what uh, I'd like to just share uh, what we do in UK. We are lucky in UK because we got a system like a uh, healthcare system, which is very established and we got support from the midwives and uh, people has uh, just, when they get pregnant, they get a book antenatal clinic and the clinic is one-to-one -one and carries on until they deliver. So it's not comparable, but some of the practices we can actually share uh, even in private sector or in Bangladesh setting, I think that uh, what is important is that one-to-one care, one -one care or senior involvement, especially if someone having had cesarean and we actually trying to support her for the successful VBAC. So as a routine, what we do, I'll just share out my screen where there, yeah, I made a small presentation of what we do at the booking at the counseling for VBAC. So as you can say, this example of it, I don't know whether, can you see my presentation? The slide? Yes, Appa. Yes, it's visible. So what we do, um, as we know that uh, if someone has a cesarean section, 
uh, we this is the example of the counseling checklist. So we go through initially about the contraindications. So if someone had previous uterine rupture or classical cesarean or uh, like previous, uh, they got currently placenta previa, thus obviously this will be contraindicated. And if they had multiple season section, uh, inverted T and Z, then we actually, depending on the, we individualize the care. It's not absolute contra contraindication. If lady wants, we will support, but it will be senior consultant involvement. And it will be very careful uh, care for that pregnancy. And then we just go with the likelihood of the VBAC. So if one prevents cell section, no previous uh, vaginal birth, the success rate we know from all the literature is about 72 to 75 percent. One prevents cell section uh, at, at least one previous vaginal birth, their success rate is even more, 85 to 90 percent. Induction of labor, previous season, vaginal birth, BMI greater than 30, previous season section for dystocia, these factors actually reduces the chance. So we go through that as well. Then we go through the what is the, uh, I'm not going to go in details because uh, Dr. Malhotra has already told in this as what is the risk for a planned uh, VBAC and the uh, emergency season section or elective season section. So this is just an example of what we do as a counseling. There's also, uh, there's some, uh, you know, that MFU uh, network is a maternal fetal medicine units network has got a calculator of VBAC success. And we follow this two calculator. One is in early pregnancy, where you look at the maternal age, maternal BMI and their height and weight, uh, uh, pre-pregnancy weight, body mass index, and the what is the obstetric history, whether they had previous uh, VBAC, they, whether had, they have already had a successful VBAC, that's why I meant no previous vaginal history, History, previous vaginal delivery only prior to the season section. And that actually gives us a, a calculation of what is their chance. And the similar, uh, in the same uh, calculator we use in the delivery, when they actually admit in delivery, where I have mentioned all the previous thing, but here we also look at the cervical dilatation, cervical effacement, and fetal station. That gives you an idea what will be the success. So if you actually go to the maternal fetal medicine units network, there's a very detailed discussion about this uh, VBAC predictor and the risk analysis, what do you do in early pregnancy and what you do in uh, when they are admitted for delivery. So, and as a practice in for induction of labor with the previous season section, we don't uh, use any prostaglandins. So it will be either if you can air them or if you can, uh, if you can air them, then oxytocin is not a contraindication, but we'll have continuous CTG monitoring. Um, and then there is nowadays, we actually doing mechanical induction with the catheter balloon. The specific balloon you can use the, in the market, but you actually can use also the police catheter, which will be quite useful. So that was all I wanted to share. Um, there was a, we, uh, Dr. Uh, Rubina Sohel already uh, explained very nicely about Robson criteria. And I also agree, agree with uh, I also agree with our uh, Professor Fernandez Wan is that if we can actually all concentrate supporting the first pregnancy and delivery, and we can stop the increased rate of first cesarean section, then of course our cesarean section rate is going to come out. So one to one care is very important. Senior involvement is very important. Avoiding early induction or unnecessary induction is very important. Um, so basically, support for the mom. Planning the pregnancy throughout is going to success the which way we're going to deliver the ladies. So that's all I want to add because all the learned <laughs> uh, speakers have already managed, uh, you know, uh, covered all the topics we wanted to know. I learned quite a lot. I actually quite excited to look at the app Dr. Malhotra has, uh, you know, uh, showed us because we also got lots of Asian population and uh, they will be very excited to know there's something is coming from India. And there is also lots of relaxation technique there, yoga and everything that will be beneficial for everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rehana Pa. Thank you, Dr. Rehana Zaman, the lead of the faculty of OBGYN of PHA for your nice addition. Now I want to know uh, something from Professor Salmarov regarding Bangladesh perspective, madam, uh, because uh, you are working uh, the 
main the government medical college hospital so if you shortly add here then we go for the question answer session madam and uh, uh, what is your uh, thinking regarding the assessment of the patient when the patient in the labor and when the patient is going for the VBAC, then the assessment of the patient is very important so what you are thinking thank you chairman uh, for the nice discussion and i'd like to express my sincere gratitude and sincere thanks to professor Narendra malhotra actually the talk was very brilliant and uh, you have covered everything starting from case selection up to the interpartum care the use of apps the checklist everything has been covered so if i can uh, share you the situation of our hospital so this is the statistics of uh, four big tertiary level public referral hospital of our Dhaka city. And where you can see that the cesarean section rate is tremendously high. It varies from 40 to 59% of total delivery. And the repeat cesarean section is maybe as high as 75%. And the VVAC rate varies from 1.5 to 14% on an average of 4.3%. So the data are not at all encouraging. So what we have to do? So uh, uh, we have learned from uh, Rubina's uh, talk and also from uh, Rehana that we need to focus on two aspects of uh, things. That one thing is to reduce the primary cesarean section rate because uh, <clears throat> that is the most important thing by which we can curtail the uh, <clears throat> cesarean section rate. So, <clears throat> So the intervention, we should start from the action need to reduce the primary cesarean section net, and we need to focus on the first four groups of RTGCS classification because these uh, women belong to this first four group are the most suitable and feasible candidate for vaginal delivery. So at institutional level, we should uh, the provider should be trained to conduct audit on regular basis according to RTGCS, uh, starting from the morning session to monthly reporting and then reporting to the higher authority like MIS and Director General Health Service and uh, should be made accountable for cesarean section rate. And at the same time, appreciation and credibility should be well addressed by yearly declaration and hours to encourage vaginal birth and to optimize the cesarean section rate. And then we have to incorporate because uh, this is the public hospital data, but the private sector where the cesarean section rate are very high. So we, step by step, we need to incorporate all the corporate hospital and the private sector to submit their monthly and yearly delivery register and statistics to the authority. In this way, we can incorporate an audit system to all and monitor the delivery system. The next step is to promote, then promote vaginal birth after cesarean section. So again, we have to start from the root, from the antenatal corner. Then um, <clears throat> we uh, start, we'll start from maternal education, counseling is a, the positive experience of vaginal birth, and it should be encouraged. And where we can use the checklist for case selection, the apps, the protocols, that uh, how to promote vaginal birth after cesarean delivery and how to uh, select case which are suitable for uh, vaginal um, uh, we can give trial of labor. So <clears throat> screening of patients should start from the history taking, physical examination, and many um, in certain cases, we can take the help of images. And after careful case selection, they should be properly counseled regarding the benefits and advantages of vaginal part. And at the same time, the small risk of catastrophe that could happen. Uh, and then uh, so that we should use a prepared guideline that we have in our obstetrics and gynecal so society's guideline. And we need to make a protocol and at the same time, the checklist. And uh, we can take the help of these apps and also the checklist um, that are using and that are described by Dr. Rehana so that we can make us, we can use this scoring system to find out the patient who are more suitable to have successful vaginal but the cesarean section. And the important thing is close interpartum vigilance. And yes, it is one-to-one -one service and the senior involvement is very important. Follow-up of patient with partograph, labor care guide, and uh, CTG for early diagnosis of uh, catastrophe is important. And delivery team should be trained uh, to conduct the vaginal birth. And at the same time, assisted vaginal delivery where needed and backup service should be available 
for 24 hours for emergency cesarean section. And record keeping and documentation should be uh, updated and uh, careful uh, auditing of audit of the patients who have undergone trial of labor and then whether they have successful vaginal birth or not and what happened that should be well documented. So it is time that we need to take the intervention. One step is to reduce the primary cesarean section rate. Actually, this is very important because conduct vaginal birth after cesarean section is a skill and that skill we have to convey or transfer to our provider with proper guidance and adequate backup service. So we need to take care of these two things uh, to reduce the repeat cesarean section rate. And that is the way we can cut off the overall cesarean section rate. So we should start from the public hospital and then we can gradually incorporate the private sector. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your nice talk. You were nicely tell about the present situation of Bangladesh and it uh, looks that we need to work more hard and the struggle is uh, more in future. So thank you, the Honorable Secretary General of uh, OGSB for joining with us. Uh, now we are going for the question and session. The question and session will be answered by Professor Narendra Malhotra and all the chairperson and discuss and also can mm -hmm. add in here. Uh, sir, one of the questions from our maximum question for our mid-level and the junior doctor, uh, they want to know about the uh, VBAC back uh, in which week it should be the perfect week. Is it 37 onwards or we can we, uh, wait for the EDD? Uh, if 37, then induction of labor is come here. So do you induce the labor or not, sir, please? So 37 completed weeks is what uh, is going to be most successful. And uh, induction has to be uh, limited because the more you induce, as Dr. Rubina said, the more chances of landing up into a failed induction because you don't have the patient to wait for the whole. And what Dr. Veena said, sweep the membranes at 37 and maybe wait for another week for the labor to set in itself. And then you can accelerate. Okay. And one thing, uh, all of uh, the students want to know, sir, if we induce the labor, uh, is there any protocol or any safe method that uh, will help us? Same, same methods as you do for primary. So if you have prostaglandins, vaginal tablets and gels available, we can put that and uh, sweep along with it. If it doesn't work, then uh, repeat the thing. If it doesn't work, you can inflate the police bulb in the cervix. You can try all of them, but you have to be very careful monitoring. So it has to be monitored. It's not like a primary because in primary pera, it will not rupture. It, what you're going to have at distress here, if you if it goes... If your foley goes a little bit in more in or too much pressure, you might have sudden catastrophe. So you have to be very careful in how you induce. Okay. Rubina, ma'am, do you want to add here anything? Uh, I just wanted to say that normally if it is a patient with a previous cesarean section and if everything is okay and we have been sweeping the membranes, normally I would go for mechanical induction. And uh, the use of prostaglandins should be restricted for selected cases after detailed counseling of the outcome of induction of labor. Uh, that needs to be discussed very, very carefully with the patient. So as a normal routine, if I want my patient to be delivered vaginally after the cesarean section, I will wait for spontaneous labor till the 48th week, not till 37 weeks. Because if you see patients with previous cesarean section, very rarely will a patient with previous C-section go into labor by 37 weeks. So 37 weeks is not the criteria. You can wait till 40 weeks for spontaneous onset of labor. If it doesn't do so, you still have one week to go. But if you want to induce, then it should be mechanical induction. And if mechanical induction fails, then re-counsel the patient, discuss the options, and then choose induction by prostaglandin if you have no other choice, and that only once. That is my take on induction of labor. So that okay. induction at 40 weeks is uh, questionable because South Asian and Indian uh, women, the maturity is earlier. And I believe 40 weeks is post date for them. It's actually 41. So maybe okay. I will never not wait till 41 at all. But so uh, maybe uh, maximum 39, but uh, that risk is always there. So you, we have 
all all got to be there carefully there yeah. so there are certain studies available which say that 39 weeks um, uh, after 39 weeks fetal compromise can happen but in the series of studies that we do in our country and the work that we do normally i would not induce any patient before 40 weeks unless there is an evidence like decrease in the amount of like or there is growth retardation or there is a reason to induce so normally um, my question to narendra is that if by 39 weeks your obstetrical patients don't go into labor do you induce all of them we we try to sweep at 38 as you said and yeah. uh, we try to see which is favorable but uh, waiting till 40 complete is we don't wait till 40 complete you don't all over india ah oh. most That's of awesome. most of us because see there are uh, i mean we have we clearly found it's like menopause age menopause age is not 50 in india it is for it is 44 45 a yeah, full term is not 40 in india it is lesser i think it is 38 39 so we have to be a little bit careful unless you go to sit and watch and then or everything as you said like her and all are normal and she's you likely to deliver a 39 would be my cut off i'm i'm a little scared of that i think what about bangladesh this is an interesting conversation what so do you madam care? would you please say okay. so i think uh, uh, from 37 weeks onwards we can start sweeping and if we really do because if you can wait up to 40 weeks there is a more chance of spontaneous onset of labor and that is more uh, favorable for uh, uh, giving a trial with a previous car uterus so we can start uh, st- uh, sweeping and actually we do we start sweeping from 37 weeks onwards and then at 40 weeks if we really do uh, have to induce the labor in that case the mechanical method is suitable like the follies uh, we actually <laughs> avoid the uh, prostaglandin we are scared to use this prostaglandin in case of a scar uterus so we prefer to give uh, follies induction and uh, if needed then oxytocin dr rehana apar you want to add something yeah yes uh, i agree with rubina and also salma madam uh we don't use even in uk we are very scared to use prostaglandin uh for induction of labor for previous cesareans is very very rare um so and but we also got quite a significant amount of asian population bangladeshi indian pakistanis we actually if there is no specific reason uh we actually wait up to 41 weeks if they are keen to wait if there is no that is the fetal growth is fine there is no contraindication to wait if the like uh, doppler everything is okay we're going to wait 41 weeks so what we do when we have the see them and the counseling and the first antenatal visit and plan throughout the pregnancy we tell them if very keen then we say listen we're going to wait for 41 weeks if you go to labor spontaneously there's very good you got a very good success of vaginal delivery Uh, and or we just then going to go for cesarean but we don't actually do any prostaglandin induction we started doing the induction with the balloon catheter which is actually success is quite good you just have to be mindful that how you counsel the patient and how how much pain relief you can you prepare them well uh so they, that's a very good uh like success rate in uk um other thing we do about the sweep we try to do the sweep from 38 weeks um and then see what happens and sometimes the ladies will come like every 72 hours to have a sweep so yeah as as i said we don't do any induction with prostaglandins but we do mechanical and if if they are arm if that we've done an up stretch on sweep and if it's possible arm then there is no contraindication for oxytocin because we can actually control the oxytocin dose um but is if in very very rare situation in my third, uh, 20 years career in uk i think i have induced two, one or two ladies with propes which is a slow release prostaglandin instead of a uh, tablet or gel because once you have done the gel or tablet is gone into your system you can't scoop it out but with the propes if there is we monitored them carefully and we actually take him out if they started hyperstimulating or 
if there is too much of contraction yes. or any CTG abnormality. But that's a very rare scenario. In, in general, in UK, all the consultant will be happy with the mechanical induction. Thank you. Thank you, Abba. Dr. Narendra, sir, another question is, uh, do you prefer to see the scar thickness routinely by ultrasonography? Yes, absolutely, yes. And then when and uh, what is your recommendation? At 36 weeks and then at labor admission. Okay, both. Uh, someone asked a question regarding the continuous hospital monitoring when the patient in uh, labor. So it's, it's actually, it is a very tough uh, for feasible, uh, right? Our country and also in setup, the continuous fetal monitoring. So uh, is it mandatory, sir, the continuous fetal monitoring? So otherwise you have to monitor the fetal heart every 15 minutes. Someone, that is even tougher. Someone just sits and every time they're watching or with a Doppler. So that is, you just put a fetal monitor. Don't take the printer trace. Just that reassuring sound continuously coming off the fetal heart is very reassuring and immediately you can pick up a even if you're sitting 10 feet away you can pick up a, or you have now we have wireless ctg we, you can sit in your room and uh, uh, the ctg can be heard or uh, comes to you so that is easier than sitting right next to the patient and looking for fetal heart every 10 minutes or 15 minutes or after every contraction rather that is very important. And uh, one uh, question, and it is repeatedly the question that is the most occasion is, is difficult to counseling and encourage for VBAC because the mother and family do not want to take any risks and want uh, the repeated uh, uh, risks for the baby. And the main thing to uh, deal with the maternal uh, request of the cesarean section. So Many of our uh, mid-level and doctors and the fellow, they want to know that uh, is there any easy way uh, to counsel them or reduction of it? See, that Sorry. is the major problem uh, with our country. <laughs> Cesarean on request and obstetrician's distress. <laughs> so these two, you have to first counsel yourself and the doctors that they are ready to sit there and uh, try for a VBAC and then only they'll be able to counsel, yes, it will succeed. So that's it. Just because of that, we are having so less VBAC, no? Why are we having only 1% or 2% um, we are successful VBACs as was shown in that Bangladesh data? It, though it is 70% success you can get, but it's still only 1% of the cases go in for this. So that is a difficult uh, choice. And of course, uh, if the woman and the parents want and demand you have to exceed to the demand. But by something, if some complication happens, then the whole thing comes to you. So that consent is very important. Counseling is very important. And if they're not agreeable, then, then you have no choice. Mm -hmm. The woman gets what she demands. It is very tough, sir, to counsel them. And uh, in this I agree, situation, I agree. reduction, the CSN. Just yes. because of that, we are having any this. special method in your country, any special way of counseling? No, no, we just, talk to them. <laughs> we just talk to them. We just tell them that um, this can be successful in 70%. You are an ideal case and your cervix is ready or this thing. Let's give you a short trial. Usually I tell them, let's give you a short trial at least. So, so some of them, I mean, most of them still don't get convinced, even with us. I think Just, I think uh, wherever wherever we are, whether we are in England or Bangladesh or India, is the most important thing is that one to one care. And I think uh, we, especially with the VBAC ladies, uh, as an obstetrician, you need to be with them from the starting of their journey, the pregnancy, and give that assurance that actually you're not going to take any risk for her or her baby. And when it is looks is going to look like in labor that she's not progressing, you are going to actually tell her that it is now we can stop and we go for cesarean. So that, that rapport or that relationship need to build up with the patient. If patient understands that actually you are with her throughout the journey and you're not going to take any risk for herself or her baby, if she can trust you, I'm sure, um, you, there'd be more success rate. As, as Dr. Professor Malhotra always says, is that um, is the obstetrician's distress. <laughs> and, and then at that distress, we if we can give time to the patient, I think that will change, uh, make lots of changes. That's what I think. What do you think, Rubina? 
Yeah, I tend to agree with you. And, you know, counseling is a skill which you keep on developing as you uh, grow older. And uh, patients with previous cesarean section actually need a lot of input from the OBGYN. Uh, they need to know that they need to trust you. They need to know that you are there. And I think everybody has been talking about one-to-one -one care, but I would just like to point out that I think that one-to-one -one care is most important when the patient is in established labor. So once the patient is in labor, that is the time that we can't leave her alone. And that time is actually not too long. So that is the time that we need to keep on interacting. And I think the second thing is we keep on using the word counseling but it is briefing of the family and the patient that we need to keep on briefing them again and again. Okay, now this is the progress. This is how far we have reached and this is our target. So once we do that kind of thing, I think the patient knows that they are in safe hands and they would trust us more. And I think adequate pain relief also helps make sure that there is no panic and good decision making because once the patient is in pain and it is not relieved, good decision making is not possible. Yeah, I just also I want to add that when actually telling the patient that when she's in established labor, if someone coming to you at like one centimeter and they're been in pain and pain and pain, if you tell them that actually they're in labor, they will count it from that point. They're not in your actually active labor until they're four centimeter or beyond. Uh, so yes, supporting them and giving them enough pain relief. And from my practice, what I do, I also tell them, listen, we're going to try until this time. So I'm going to examine you. Say you're four centimeter now. I will give, if everything goes okay, CTG is fine. I'm going to give you four hours and I expect you to di dilate maybe six to eight centimeters. Yeah. And then if you, everything is still okay, you still like four centimeter, I can give you maximum another two to four hours. So they actually knows what we're doing and they will, from the starting, they will know there's a plan. So. We also, as we said, yes, as Rubina said, it has to be in labor, how we support them, keep them like, you know, give them good pain relief, one to one support and having a plan and every steps in their pregnancy, in their delivery, we have to have a plan that how far we're going to try. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Appa. Yes, uh, we have a shortage of time. We are taking the last question. The last question is one of the patient in uh, government medical college hospital who have a uh, history of uh, LUCS 2.6 year back, that been two and a half year back. Now she came with conjoint twin uh, and with multiple congenital anomaly of 24 weeks, abdominal diameter 120 millimeter. How she will deliver? Dr. Narendra, sir. So if it is a big baby and it's going to have uh, a dystocia or not going to come out, see that, and if it is you said 24 weeks? 24 weeks. 24 weeks? Yes, so 24 weeks with congenital anomaly with conjoint twin. Uh, so we're going to mechanically try to mechanically dilate as uh, prostaglandin is going to be ripens the cervix, and then we can think of uh, accelerating by oxytocin or prostate or whatever you So we'll try mechanical dilatation, try to deliver a vagina. Why give her a scar for an anomalous baby? Salma, madam, do you want to add? Dr. Salma Yeah. Uh, we can follow the mid-trimester uh, mid uh, um, protocol for induction of labor. It's a, it's a 24 weeks. But the problem is, is that Conjoint to the abdominal circumference is 128. That is the problem thing because otherwise uh, it won't be, be a problem. If we follow the mid trimester protocol of giving me Priston and followed by misopostal, then we can safely terminate the pregnancy. But here is the problem in the abdominal circumference. That the is the circumference too. Yeah. Well, when I was, when I was uh, in my postgraduate my boss used to do a lot of destructive operations and we would yeah <laughs> that i'm thinking do destructive in the abdomen release it and we we've, we've done that also but i i don't think i'll attempt something like that now no. yeah <laughs> that was the evisceration narendra we used to do the evisceration evisceration yes evisceration we used to do previously we, like destructive we, yeah, in this case what salma is mentioning there will be a difficulty taking out the baby even if it is full dilated with uh, 
mechanic. Uh, we, we would have gone for destructive operation when in the previous days. But nowadays, we don't think about it. I think that with the previous cesarean scar and conjoined twins, even at 24 weeks, I would go for operative intervention. Yes. Histotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, so I, I agree. Safer. Safest way out. I would not use any prostaglandin if it is possible mechanical dilatation. And as Rubina said, I don't know how much we're going to achieve because it's conjoined yes. twins. So maybe she will end up with a hysterotomy anyway. So, but we need to counsel in both ways saying that, listen, we can try, but you may end up with a hysterotomy and the scar in the uterus. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Appa. Absolutely Thank you, the agree. discussion. Yes. Thank you, Professor Narendra, sir, for your excellent addition. And it is a very fruitful uh, session, I think so, for our, especially the young fellows and the mid-level doctor. And the main thing of the recommendation is we need to promote the vaginal birth after cesarean section. We need to make it popularization. We need to reduce the cesarean section rate all over the South Asian region. And also one-to-one -one, uh, care of the maternal care to reduction of the maternal and neonatal mortality and morbidity is very, very important to ensure in uh, the developing countries like ours. So thank you very much to all. So uh, we are near the end of the session. May I request uh, Professor uh, Tasbir Islam, do you want to add anything here, sir? Unmute yourself, please. One second. Yes. Yes, I think I'm on mute, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, thank you so much. Uh, being a pulmonary and critical care uh, specialist, and uh, actually I thought maybe after my initial you know, talk or um, I, I will leave the session because when I don't deal with VBAC, but to be honest, I stayed throughout the, I stayed all the way because it was so learning uh, for me, to be honest. So. Uh, this is the, I want to, first of all, I'm glad that uh, at the end, there's a discussion of the patient's counseling involving the patient, involving the family. Nowadays, we do patient-centered care. That means we involve the family and patient as a, I consider the family and the patient as a part of the team. As intensivist, when I do round in ICU, actually we involve the patient and family as a team, and they actually participate in the multidisciplinary round. Actually, they are actually be a present in the round. So, and we can see our patient satisfaction, patient's outcome, the patient's care is through the roof. So I think it's very important uh, to involve the patient and family from day one. So thank you so much, Professor Narendra Malhotra, uh, for an excellent uh, presentation. It is short and precise and so informative. I want to thank all the panelists today. Uh, again, I want to invite all the PHA Global Summit in 2024 that will be in Dhaka in February, uh, on February 23rd and 24th. And I hope you all can join to the Global Summit and I will send, uh, hopefully we'll send the uh, official invites very soon. And uh, Sharmin will take care of the, Sharmin and Rehana is taking care of the OBGY uh, session. So, and they will be in touch with you all uh, to figure out the, uh, the topics, the panelists, the speakers, and the chair sessions. So again, thank you so much for having me today. I enjoyed thoroughly. And uh, again, uh, invite to all for our PHA Global Summit 2024 in February. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm just taking small take home message. For, uh, start from the Narendra, sir. Sir, what is your take home message to our uh, trainee doctors? Because lots of trainee doctors joined today regarding VBAC. Learn to deliver patients vaginally. <laughs> Thank yes, you, sir. We, 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 were taught, we were taught to put forceps right from my day one of my residency. And the boss said, here, here she's stuck the Put a forceps. I said, I don't know how to what a forceps looks like. So, no, no, you, that's how you learn. And thousands of deliveries done by Ventus extraction. My mother was an expert in it. So learn how to do a vaginal delivery is my business. Excellent. Excellent take-home message for the young doctors. Now to to 
chairpersons, Professor Rubina Ma'am and Professor Farnadon Ma'am. First of all, uh, Rubina Ma'am, uh, would you please uh, add the take home message of today's session? My take home message is avoid the first and second section. That is a must. Only if we reduce the primary cesarean section will we reach any. That indicates we need to reduce the primary cesarean section rate. That will uh, reduce the repeated cesarean section rate. Thank you, madam. And Professor Farnadon, madam, uh, would you yeah. recap the session? Thank you, yes, Charmin. Uh, my take home message is because we want, we have to go, we should go for VBSC, VBAC. So we should be, uh, we should teach. Um, all the residents, uh, every everybody who is because diet, uh, like Narendra sir, uh, teach vaginal delivery, how people will do vaginal delivery and have a very structured um, uh, protocol for the VBAC so that mishaps don't occur. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. So thank you all for joining with us. Uh, we have a, now the quiz session and the quiz winner will get a very exciting prize of the very uh, good PHA Bluetooth. So first question uh, for the quiz is uh, for doing a pelvimetry in a 34 years old uh, para one 34 weeks gestation who is in labor, the patient is noted to be six centimeter dilated and completely effaced with the fetal nose and mouth palpable. The chin is pointing toward the maternal left hip. Uh, this is an example of which of the following? Transverse lie, momentum transverse position, occipital transverse position, brow presentation, or vertex presentation. Waiting for the answer. Okay, we get the answer. Now we go for the second question. A patient presents uh, in a labor uh, and clinical pelvimetry is performed. She has an oval shaped pelvis with interposterior diameter at the pelvis inlet greater than the transverse diameter and occipital posterior position. The patient most likely has what kind of pelvis? Gynecoid, android, anthropoid, androgenous, which will be the answer. The right answer winner will get the gift. The third question is, you were counseling in 36 years old obese patient in 36 weeks of gestation about root of delivery. During her first pregnancy, she was induced at 41 weeks gestation for mild preeclampsia and delivered by cesarean section. As a result of the fetal distress during her induction, the patient would like to know if she can have a trial of labor after cesarean section with this pregnancy. Which of the following is the best response to the patient? Number A, no, since she has never had a vaginal delivery. B, yes, but only if she had a low transverse uterine incision. C, no, because once she has had a cesarean delivery, she must deliver all of her subsequent children by cesarean delivery. D, yes, but only if her skin incision was a fenestyle. E, yes, but she must wait until she go into labor spontaneously to have a repeat cesarean section. So what will be the answer? I think we will get the answer. The correct answer giver will get the quiz prize and we will uh, inform you and we will connect you. So I would like to tell our faculty lead, Rehana Appa, we are just near the end. So Appa, with your talk, we will end the session. Up, please. Uh, thank you. A big, big, big thank you to Professor Malhotra, uh, to Rubina, and all of the learned panelists, and that, uh, we had a very excellent discussion. I hope that actually our middle grade and junior doctors or trainees have actually learned a lot. I myself had learned quite a lot 
So I really thank everyone for that. I think there was a question on the chat box from one of the doctors about how much of uh, fluid we put in the balloon catheter. We do 30 ml of fluid on the balloon catheter for mechanical induction, and it stays there if possible for 24 hours, but with adequate pain relief. And the patient needs to be counseled well, and patient needs to be very motivate, motivated. Uh, so that's the way we do the balloon catheter, because there was a question I was trying to look to answer, but I couldn't find the doctor anymore. But as I said, I, we like to invite all of you to our conference in February. So Rubina, special invitation, Professor Malhotra, special invitation, please try to attend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rubina, ma'am, for your nice time. And thanks to all for joining with us. Uh, more than 100 uh, joined in the Zoom and 2,000 in the social media. So it's a very good session and many of our doctors learned on it. So uh, our winner is Nargis Nahar. Nargis Nahar, would you please give your phone number so it is easy for us to look at you. Dr. Nargis Nahar, who is working in the Evercare Hospital. So big congratulations to Dr. Nargis Nahar. Would you, madam, uh, mention your phone number here so we can reach you and send the gift to you? Congratulations to Dr. Nahar. And one request to Tasbi, sir, Rehana, and to me that glad to know, sir, thanks, Tasbi, sir. We would like forward for Nepalese. So the faculty is from Nepal wants to join with us. So, sir, would you please take care for the future time to include the Nepalese with us? So, Nargis oh, Nahar. Actually, I responded, I responded. I responded to Dr. Yadov's uh, the conversation. So, I responded to him. So, yeah, I'll take care of it. Thank okay. you so much, Sherman. Okay, sir. So, with the permission of the faculty lead and the chair of the PHA, we are just concluding the session. Thank you very much to all for the fantastic session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.